I'm not a vendor. I'm not trying to sell you something for money, but I'm going to put a few ideas in front of you. And I view my job here as first to get us to lunch in a reasonable time. <laughs> um, second, uh, to get questions from you. Some of these we'll do at lunch, but I'm going to go against my the people who invited me here, and I'm still going to I'm going to solicit questions at any time because uh, otherwise uh, I could have just made a video and we could do uh, some sort of conference call for the for the questions. That's not what I want. And then the the third part is to put a few ideas in front of you that might get the questions to be uh, important for you. And I was asked to talk about simplicity. And there are some interesting paradoxes there. But the, first, I'd like to deal with a metaphor about ideas. And the question is, are ideas made out of ponderable matter, in which case, Ideas oppose each other. They can't be in the same place at the same time. Or are ideas made out of light, in which case we can have any number of ideas in the same place at the same time. We don't have to choose between them. And sometimes even the color changes can be very suggestible. Similarly, are ideas things, or are they processes? So I'm going to take the right-hand side view here and put a bunch of things in front of you, some of which uh, may seem somewhat paradoxical. In fact, the yikes curve here, this is a curve everybody knows in this room, represents quite a bit of the last maybe 100 years, but certainly for most of you, the time that you've been in your career, there's always some exponential happening. And at any given point in time, represented by the vertical line there, there's a yikes factor. In corporations, it's not just the competitive pressure, but all the legacy this is and that's that need to be tended to, people think, but are costing more and more. In fact, they're costing so much in the realm of software that corporations have actually been unwittingly destroying the very agencies that could help them. Namely, corporations are telling universities that they need people who are experts in programming in this language or that language. All of those languages are completely obsolete, but they happen to be the ones that your legacy software is written in. And because universities have decided to turn themselves into businesses, they're feeling the pressure from businesses because they want to get money from the businesses. And so the businesses are actually undermining their own future because you're systematically killing off the people who might actually come up with much better software solutions. Remember 50, 60 years ago when I started, uh, most uh, corporate software is written in machine code. Somebody had to invent the higher level languages that were good for a few years. Uh, unfortunately, we're still using them, ones basically from the 60s. Things have to be reinvented over and over again. And the other thing about the Yikes curve is the actual complexity part of the Yikes might be a lot lower. Might actually be a tiny part of the Yikes. And perhaps we could call the, the other part of it from that nice little thing down there up to where the Ikes is, we could call that uh, complications. So complications are basically noise, bad technique, old technique, uh, human bumbling, uh, inability to get on learning curves, you name it. It's a whole bunch of factors. And quite a bit of the stuff in corporations today, if you examine it, I think you'll all agree with me, as most of you are CIOs, uh, if you've looked actually at the code. And I think the tide is turning with CIOs, because 
when I first started giving talks like this to CIOs, about 80% of them were from the financial organization. They really didn't know anything about computing. And so it was very hard to explain what computers were possible, what, what, what they could do. But now it's, it's different. And I think if you've looked at the code in your company, you'll realize that, wow, I've got millions and millions of lines of code there. And I have more than a sneaking suspicion that a lot of that code is actually in my way. It doesn't represent the actual bang per line of code that uh, we'd expect from a higher level language. So going back in history, anybody ever seen a diagram like this before? Somebody? They don't show them in business school, but the other part of the campus. So this is, uh, <laughs> this is what uh, the planets, the paths of the planets travel over an entire year. This was actually done in the 17th century. And I'll show you shortly one done a little bit earlier. And you can see why they're called planets. The planet is a Greek word meaning wanderer. So these curly cues are actually, for instance, what, the orbit, what Mercury does if you look at it every night. It will come into view, and it will go this way across the sky. But then all of a sudden, it will come back, going in the opposite direction. And you can see why it's hard to do astronomy if you have two moving things in orbits going at different speeds and viewing each other at different times of the year. Very, very hard to understand what's actually going on. And there were some religious beliefs going all the way back to the Greeks that said God is a perfect being and therefore would only use circles to explain the course of these orbits. And uh, it turns out uh, the orbits are not circular. And especially if you put the Earth in the center instead of the sun. And so they came up with this idea that you see here on the top right, which is, OK, we'll take a circular orbit and we'll put another circle. So as the pl planet goes around in the larger circle, it's also going in the smaller circle. And combining the two circles, as you see there, will give us something that has these loops that we see. This is called an epicyclic theory of orbits. And when uh, Copernicus went over to putting the sun in the center, he also believed that God was perfect. And so he decided they would be circular orbits. So the problem is Coper whatever you've heard in school was wrong. Copernicus's scheme only made things slightly more simple. But in fact, it still had this mess. And you can put more. Epicycles. Does this sound like anything you're familiar with? You hang on to that old theory, no matter what it is, and you start putting fixes in, just like software. Let's not rewrite it. Oh, no. Let's not find a better way of rewriting the software. Oh, no, let's not do that. Let's just patch it. Natural human tendency, that's what they did in astronomy back then. This is before science got invented for real. Tycho was extremely meticulous. And Kepler, decided, who worked with him, decided to believe his measurements. This is for Mars. And Kepler decided, well, I sort of believe in God, but let's try something else. So the first thing he tried were ovals, because they would fit the actual orbits better. And not quite enough. And then finally he got around. He said, well, what about ellipses? And he had thought about ellipses because it's the next thing after circles. And it, he didn't try ellipses for years. You know why? Because he figured that the people before him who were really smart had already tried ellipses and found them wanting. No. They were really smart, but they were too dumb to get off their circles that they loved so much. So when Kirk Kepler plugged ellipses, in, lo and behold, everything cleared up. Even comets were explained. Bingo. What's the expense of getting simplicity? And I'm going to go over this a few more times, because it's, it's not the only way of getting simplicity. But boy, 
one of the things that's worked the best the last three or four hundred years is you get simplicity by finding a slightly more sophisticated building block to build your theories out of. It's when you go for a simple building block that anybody can understand through common sense. That is when you start screwing yourself right and left. Because it just might not be able to ramify through the degrees of freedom and scaling that you have to go through. And it's this inability to fix the building blocks that is one of the largest problems that computing has today in large organizations. People just won't do it. OK, why won't we do it? Well, one of the things is that our brains were set up for dealing with about 100 people at a time, living by our wits, hunting and gathering, and dying in the same world we were born into for hundreds of thousands of years. There's no concept of progress in our genes. We just don't have it. But like all animals, we have an enormous set of genetic apparatus to make us good copers. Anything happens to us, we can find a way of being resilient about it and adapting to it. We're copers and adapters. And so when we come up against difficulties, our tendency is to cope with these difficulties. It's like working for a company. Go into a company <laughs> and the company seems sort of screwed up, maybe. You can quit, you can cope, but your chances of actually changing the company are very low because nobody will listen to reason. <laughs> right? That is not what the company is there for. They are there for their A task. And this is something that Engelbart, the, the inventor of the mouse, pointed out years ago, that companies are devoted to their A, a task, which is what they think they're about. Most companies do not have a very good B process, which is supposed to uh, look at the A tasks and make them more efficient. But almost no companies have a C process which questions the tasks. Are our goals still reasonable? Are our processes still reasonable? That's the last thing that gets questioned because, wow, how do you deal with change if we're going to change our basic process in the midst of everybody hammering on us for quarterly earnings? So this is a huge, huge problem. And yet it can be done. It's just really, one rarely sees it. So here's an old model from the 19th century of memory, which actually, in the 21st century, has come back as a pretty good one, as a metaphor anyway. So the idea is that rain comes down on the ground, and there's a little irregularities randomly there. And at some point, those irregularities will be a little more responsive to the rain and a little channel will form. And the channel acts as an amplifier. And so wherever that channel got started, it starts funneling lots more water through it. Other water is draining into it. And all of a sudden, it starts cutting deeper. And you get these gullies. And you get down into these gullies, you have to remember to look up, because everything down there in this gully is kind of pink. You could think that the world is pink. And in fact, if you get into a real gully, one of my favorites is the Grand Canyon. By the way, that's only 100 million years of erosion to get the Grand Canyon. It's relatively recent. You get into one of these things, and the enormity of what you see outwards dwarfs what you can see if you look up, if you've ever been on one of these things. You're just in a different world. It's a pink world. You don't think about climbing out of it. You think about moving along in it. And so I'm going to take that gully world and flatten it out. Here's our pink world. And let's take human thought as being like an ant. And that ant can move all over this two-dimensional world. Our world, to us, is basically two-dimensional, maybe a sphere to larger beings, but for us it's basically flat. And we can move all over it. We can make plans. We can encounter obstacles. We can solve those problems and get around them. 
So in this two-dimensional world here, we have all the paraphernalia of living and thinking. And if we grew up in that world, we don't know it's pink. Right? Because that's all there is. That is the background color. It's the thing we are least interested in because it's the most constant thing. But every once in a while, uh, we might have a little blue thought. Could be waking up in the morning, taking a shower. But remember, we grew up in this world. We went to church. We have parents we're going to school. Pink. Pink is what the reality is. But every once in a while, you get a kerpow. That kerpow is out of that world. It's actually an escape from that world. And in the old days, when people had one of these, they would start a new religion. <laughs> because if you've, how many people have had a kerpow of any kind? Like the technical word for a kerpow is holy shit. How many people have had a, come on, how many people have had a holy shit? Holy shit. Where does, that, where does it come from? So the subjective sense we have is we didn't have that thought. Something put that thought into our head. It just happened. So of course, if you don't have science and you're not wired to check out the kerpows, it seems to come from the heavens. OK, so we dip into another world. This world, let's call it a blue world, blue plane world. And there are three things here. This explains why we have trouble making progress. If we treat our beliefs as reality, then how sane is blue? The answer is, well, it's not sane. Sanity is relative to the things we believe are true. So the first thing is you, you've immediately turned yourself into a crackpot for a few nanoseconds. And that's one of the fists that comes down and squashes you back out into the pink world. I don't want to be crazy. Second one is when you try and explain this idea to somebody else, they really have to go through a similar process. This is probably the most difficult thing about an age of invention like the one that we live in. The inventors. Actually, invention is actually relatively easy with the right kind of funding. So the problem is getting something, is essentially pulling other people into a blue world, given that the blue world isn't a complete, isn't really completely nutty. And then the third idea is that the blue plane is also a gully. So they have a half-life. So each one of these things, salvation. 20 years later, it's, got, it's the albatross around your neck. Right? And so anytime a company does something successful, and you can talk to corporate executives about it, they really think it's like they invented something really important. No, in fact, they just found a heuristic that's working for a while, and if they forget to re-examine that heuristic, they're going to be in the same plight once, once again. So this is a real picture. It's not, the sign says, do not touch any of these wires. <laughs> and it's important to realize that every single one of these wires was a solution to a perceived problem. There's no other reason why it was done. It was done over a period of time. This is related to this idea. You know, anybody can make a doghouse. You can make it out of almost anything, matchsticks even. You can make it out of cardboard. You can make it out of just about anything. Maybe toothpicks. You might have to take some care. Nothing to it. But let's try and just scale that doghouse by a factor of 100. So now it's about 150 feet high. 
It's tiny compared to the Superdome, but that doghouse will just fall in on itself. Completely. Has no structural integrity. And the reason is that when you double a solid, the mass goes up by a factor of eight. And the strength in simple materials like wood and beams and stuff has to do with the area. It's like the strength in our muscles. This is why gymnasts are small. They're small because they can have relatively large muscles. They have short muscle arms, and they weigh quite a bit less. That's why a grasshopper can jump 100 times its own length, and we can't. They have the same kind of muscle fibers as we do. And so the scaling thing takes what is a, a very nice idea for a dog and one you can have in two seconds and hit it together into something that you really do not want to carry into any kind of larger scales because there, there's no connection to the scaling. And if we come back to what we can do with out special knowledge, we wind up with an Egyptian pyramid. It's the only big thing you can build without knowing how to build, which is just a big garbage dump and plaster it over with limestone so it looks good. But if you think about it, you can't, it has no room inside. So in order to get the Superdome, you have to do that other thing. You have to go back to a different conception of what the materials are, which are actual utensil structures. And then you can build enormous domed structures that scale very, very well. So if we come back to this tangle, I just put software in here. It could be anything. The result of incremental problem solving so this research community I came out of, Advanced Research Projects Agency in the 60s, and then Xerox Park, which was an outgrowth of it, basically it was a bunch of small number of people who had big ideas who did not have big resources. They didn't want to give up their ideas, and so they were faced with this dilemma, is that they could not handle they wanted to build a network that would go over the entire world. It was called the Intergalactic Network back before it was called the Internet. And they could not use any technique that uh, Bell Telephone, AT&T, used. Because it didn't scale. Just completely out of the scope. And finally, in the 60s, one of the, the organizing uh, Insights was, hey, computers are virtualizers. That's what universal Turing machine means. What that means is forget about wires. You don't need no stinking wires. What we need to do is to understand how to organize systems as virtual entities. And we can render some of them in hardware, and we'll render some of them in software. But in fact, everything winds up being something like a single uh, communications line with an arbitrary number of, of entities on it. Everyone can talk to everyone else, and all of a sudden you've thrown away all the things that Bell Telephone had, and every piece of the way most software was done, and replaced it with a simple messaging system. And all of a sudden, few people could do amazing things. So this is an example. I'll, I'll bring this up again in a couple of times, but basically you need to solve the context. You need to solve the Grand Canyon problem. Most people are rewarded in school for solving problems. When was the last time your child or you were rewarded for finding a problem? You found a new problem? We've got too many already. Right? Whereas in fact, finding what the real problem is is the big deal. And people will fight you every step of the way. They'll fight your kids in school every step of the way if they're a problem finder type. Don't let the teachers hurt them. Most problems are bogus because they come out of the current context. We're trying to get beyond the current context. So forget about problem solving. It's just a bad heuristic. It's the last thing you do. And so you get these leaps. So here's a leap out of the context of the 20th century, mid-20th century, which is a gear kind of thing. Everything is closely articulated. 
the interfaces are very uh, tightly bound, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is you can only make a thing with about 1,000 gears in it before it seizes up. You just can't get the tolerances good enough. Does that sound like software? Just can't do it. But when you go to biology, we have 100 trillion cells in our body. Each and every body in here has about 100 trillion cells. OK, I'm going to ask the audience a question. You haven't asked me one yet. But the question I'll ask is, who knows how many of these 100 trillion cells in our body have our DNA in them? OK, uh, predominant answer is all of them. Anybody else got an opinion? So it turns out only 10% of them. Only 10 trillion of those 100 trillion cells have our DNA. The other 90 trillion, 9 tenths of the cells in our body are slime. <laughs> and that slime uh, has, people have been counting the species of microorganisms, you know, bacteria. E. coli is one of them. That should have been a clue. E. coli has its own DNA, which is uh, very different from ours. Uh, so at last count, I went on the internet the other night to see was uh, getting close to 25,000 different species of microorganisms, most of which we have no idea what they're doing inside of us. And they're about one two thousandth the size of our regular cells, so the 90 trillion cells of slime is a, about a basketball size of stuff all over us everywhere. That ought to make you feel better about lunch. <laughs> But the point is, uh, nobody's come close to building anything with 100 trillion parts or a trillion parts uh, without, we don't, the only things we know that actually work with that many parts are biological things. Something to think about. And that gave us researchers back then a kind of a unified vision. Everything, this is a self-portrait of the internet after we built it. But this is the image. Hey, everything is like this. This is a biological model. We, we can't scale and have central control. Big problem with com companies. They start off like families with the head of the family, try and get bigger. This is why monarchies are tough. Right? No way. You have to find a way of distributing control and distributing responsibility in an ecological way. This is not thing, things that human beings like to think about. People are uncomfortable. Who's running the show, people say. Well, the answer is the internet does not have any center, and it's grown by almost 10 orders of magnitude now without ever breaking. Your software breaks all the time. The internet has never broken. It's replaced all of its atoms and all its bits at least twice since it started in 1969. It has never been taken down for maintenance. Think about that. Your software could be like that. The software we did at Xerox Park was like that. Your software could be just running eternally. And so everything, at the expense of going to something more complicated than a data structure or some wires, everything can be built out of a single kind of entity that has functionality inside, it provides services on the outside, and there is something like a cell boundary on it. It's worthwhile thinking about that. So if we come to Park, here are a couple of things we did. Personal computer, this is basically in the 70s. Bitmap screens, the GUI, WYSIWYG and desktop publishing, what we like to call real loop now since the term object-oriented got taken from us by C++ and Java. Laser printer. PostScript, Ethernet, peer peer and client server, and about half of the internet, because we had our own internet. So these are about nine and a half inventions. And how were they done and who did them? Well, 25 researchers did all of them. 25. Think about it. 
cost about $12 million a year in today's money. Every single company in this room, every single 500 Fortune company, these are fingernail clippings on your IT budgets. You waste more than this every other week. And despite that, there's not a single company in America that, until recently, that has even taken the venture of doing a process like this. And you have to ask yourself why. It's a question you really need to understand, because we're not talking about money here. Return, 30 plus trillion dollars and counting, actually around 35 trillion at last count. What was the problem? And it was not the problem of Xerox not making any money. This is a story made up by companies to avoid having to contemplate doing a long-term research center. This is an urban legend, just absolutely untrue. In fact, Xerox paid for all of Park more than 200 times over with the laser printer alone. Isn't that the most obvious thing? How many billions have they made? The big problem with Xerox is they only wanted to make billions. And that's the problem with most companies. Because when you're doing this kind of stuff, you're actually in the trillion dollar range, and no company has ever been able to step up to the plate. And just one other point, because I'll get to it in a second, again, is that of all of these inventions, we had to have all of them. We had to do all of them. But the one that reached this stuff out to everybody was probably the GUI, because it is the meeting ground between people who don't know computer speak and what the computer can do. So it is the thing that allowed this to go out to multiple billions of people now. OK, so oh, you guys are mostly CIOs, so I, I don't ask you this question. But when I meet a CEO, I always ask them, are you going to be in business in 10 years and prospering? What do you think they say? And they look kind of like that. <laughs> you know, I, I, I was searching for a face, and I realized, wait a minute, Cheney. Cheney has got the perfect face for this guy. And yeah, my next question is, well, what is your 10-year plan? And the reaction I get is that. <laughs> right? Think about it. The idea of a 10-year plan that people are serious about is just, it's fake. Companies just don't have it. They don't set themselves up to be able to deal with this thing, which is really just a fond hope that they're going to be in business in 10 years. They have no idea. So let me ask you a question. Just think for a second. Where were you 10 years ago? 10 years ago was 2005. The country was going through some real problems back then. And then realize, how, how far ago does 2005 seem? Well, it doesn't seem that far ago, but it was 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, today was 10 years in the future. Think of what we could have done if we didn't think 10 years was big. We could have thought all kinds of things in 2005 and pulled them off by now. But because 10 years seems impossibly long in business terms, most of these things never even get talked about. It's way too far off. We're worrying about next quarter. So if we plot out an invention process like Xerox Park, let's imagine we can come up with a 10-year vision and basically, everything we did at Xerox Park was thought of as a five-year horizon when we did something. And it turns out five-year horizons are necessary in order to get done earlier. So in a five-year horizon, most of the inventions come about in the first three years. If you set a three-year horizon, you're not going to get them. Because that just isn't the way people work. That five-year horizon allows people to do the right thing the first year. If you try and narrow it in too much, they will not do the right thing the first year. And same thing, innovation, taking an idea 
out into the marketplace, five-year horizon, there's a transfer process. Most of the, when I was at Apple, most of the innovation processes for big things we did uh, took about three years, but were organized kind of like this. And so you get, when everything's going well, the wind is right, the creek hasn't risen. You get about a seven-year thing out of this 10-year framework that you have to set up. Well, that's kind of interesting. So suppose we had done this, we go back seven years now, this is 2008, that was just next door. And what happens? Well, same thing, 10-year vision, all that stuff I showed before, seven years, bingo, today is the day that the seven-year thing came out. And if you just study how this stuff works from things that are basically new, not simple increments like uh, new web apps, but things that are new, seven years is about the fastest you can do it, and you can almost always do it in under 10. So that means a small amount of money, but allocated over a time that could be longer than most CEOs stay around, is actually, this is the problem in government, it's hard to carry out long-range policies when the politics are changing all the time. Now, the problem with this in America is there's no business reward system here because the costs for this have to be expense, right, Reuben? It's like the, Reuben is a good guy here. Nobody has been more delightfully clever at helping these good processes along than Reuben, in my experience. But the cards are stacked against companies because every dollar you take out of this thing is a dollar that could improve the bottom line for this quarter reporting, and that is wrong. Change that law. You've got every other law changed. Look at the laws on depreciation, for crying out loud. Those are ridiculous, but they're in business's favor. You have to have something that contrasts favorably rather than the huge disparity between this, where you've got the right process going, but it's hard to pay for it, with a, an idea that is not so good, which is to uh, uh, acquire every time you want something. Right? Acquiring acquisitions you can do with different money, but you start killing your corporate culture. Right? You have that problem. But yet, it's much more favorable because of the kind of money you're allowed to use for it. So this is crazy. And until that happens, the universities are the only place that are going to save you. That is how this stuff got here. ARPA funded universities because it, IBM couldn't do it. And they were spending billions, literally billions of dollars in research, but it was the wrong kind of process. So, okay, so this is, these are just a few slides from uh, a talk I gave at Disney when I was there 15 years ago, which is all the different ways, uh, new ways companies have invented to kill that goose. So one of them was, well, let's just eat it. Forget about those eggs. Or... This is a good one. Our latest innovation is a goose that lays eggs of solid gold. That's a distraction from our core. And we have no budget for goose-related expenses. On that note, we'll need the feathers and liver for another project. <laughs> Only one gold egg every 12? Or I want gold coins. This is a Disney one. I want gold coins rather than golden eggs. Or I want platinum eggs. No, you can buy platinum with the gold from these eggs. Make the goose a manager. Give the goose a deadline. Require the goose to explain to you how they're going to make the next egg. Every one of these, this is, as, this is just at the level of ridiculousness that's going on. They're missing the point that nobody who d does these kind of worries has ever laid a golden egg. It's not their business to deal. What their business is, is to count those golden eggs after they get laid. 
Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna wind up here. Yeah, I'm gonna wind up here just giving you an example of a process that we used all the time back in the 60s and the 70s and we still use today. And there are enough, I always look at the reflection from the heads in the room. So if there's a lot of reflection, it means there's white hairs and no hairs. <laughs> and what that means is that there are a fair number of people who still remember who Wayne Gretzky was, right? Greatest hockey player who ever lived. And he had a couple of neat ones. One was, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. They're asking, why are you the greatest hockey player in the world? He only weighed like 160 pounds. He was tiny compared to the rest of these. But his best one was, was the good hockey players go to where the puck is, and great hockey players go to where the puck is going to be. And he didn't mean tracking the puck. He meant get to that place in the rink where somebody can pass you the puck that you can shoot a goal. He was better at anybody at knowing where that place would be, and his teammates would feed him in bingo. And so the 30-year the Wayne Gretzky game is to have a glimmer of an idea, take it out 30 years where, where there's no possibility of incrementally worrying about how am I going to get from where I am now to this idea. Right? That is the, the idea killer of all time. How is this incremental to the present? And the answer is, forget it. Don't worry about now. The present is the least interesting time to live in. So a little glimmer of an idea I had, and the sentence would be, it would be ridiculous if we didn't have, so I had a little idea about children. We were thinking about personal computing in the 60s, and I started thinking about, well, what about a computer for children? Personal computers are going to be the next greatest invention after the printing press, and we have to do something for children. And, we don't want children to lean over a desk. We want them to be outside, and et cetera, et cetera. So I thought, well, it'd be nice to have a little tablet. And in this scenario, they are actually learning about orbital dynamics at age 12 from having written a little version of Space War themselves. And the two computers are communicating by wireless. So that was a fairly, you know, just Turned out ARPA was fooling around not just with the internet in those days, but called the ARPANET then, but with wireless versions of it. And so if you take it out 30 years, the puck is going to be there 30 years, and Moore's Law is going to go like that, which had been well covered and predicted in 1965 out to 1995, the answer is, yeah, God damn it, no question. 1995, there is no way we are not going to have a tablet computer. No way. It's just going to happen. We don't even have to worry about right now what we're going to do it, because what we have to do is to figure out what it should be. Once you start thinking about it, then the next interesting part of it is bring back a more concrete version. So out there, you can do pie in the sky. But what about 10 or 15 years out? What could we do then? And the answer is, yeah, we could do one then. What would that be like? Well, we don't know. We have all these problems, including the user interface problem. No, nope, we've never had something like this for the general public. Now, here's the cool thing about Moore's Law, which still exists today, and you're seeing it in HANA. And that is, you can buy your way into the future. So HANA could have appeared 15 years earlier if people had realized that it was in completely inevitable. HANA is Moore's law applied to disks. Namely, you don't need them. And we have to do all of this uh, software stuff now, so we want to get there earlier at higher expense because we're going to save more money. This is where simplicity comes from. Pay more, it's like a Fram oil filter commercial. Buy those $5 things frequently, and you don't 
wind up with the big expenses later on. And so by just spending money, you can take something that's going to be a couple of thousand bucks, 10 to 15 years you know, out in the late 80s, you can bring it back into the 70s for $20,000, $30,000. So that's what we did. That's where the Xerox thing that looks like the, the Mac. So the Mac was actually a prototype of this laptop. Because we couldn't build that display in 1971, but we could build something that would do everything else. So that's where uh, Mac-type personal computers came from. And the, we had a genius by the name of Chuck Thacker who uh, was able to actually build this machine in a little over three months. And I had another genius working for me by the name of Dan Ingalls who could take some of my object-oriented ideas and user interface ideas and actually make a system on this prototype laptop that happened to be a couple of cubic feet big. And I was kind of in there doing this. I, I wrote the first interpreter for the first object-oriented language as part of this thing there. And uh, we made 2,000 of these. Now, here's the two things you get by paying this money. Sounds like a lot. I mean, Xerox went batshit. $22,000 a computer, and you want to make 2,000 of them? We said, no, this is nothing. Nothing. They have to be all networked together and all this stuff. But you can do two things. Everybody has a supercomputer. What does that mean? It means we can do zillions of experiments without having to optimize. We can do 10, 15, 20 user interface experiments today. So by the way, these don't cut it. You've got all your people working on these things, but these are the machines of the past. So you, you cannot do a new user interface on this, right? Because you haven't given them the supercomputers. You're trying to get next stage user interface out of last year's machines. And the other thing you can do is if you do optimize, then you can make far future apps. And we made quite a few of them. The most famous one is Microsoft Word, which was actually made in 1974. And that very system was the one that ran in the 80s. OK, so that's how you get the, the puck into the goal. And this particular process is needed because before you can deal with the present, you have to deal with the future. Then you can bring back into the present that blue plane version of the future rather than trying to increment off the, uh, off the pink plane. OK, last slide. Give you something to think about here. Is this idea of thresholds. So how many people have seen curves that look like these? Progress against time, right? Everywhere. Reading. Scores, test scores, people love these. Yay, oh no. Yay, oh no. It's bad because our, our nervous system is only set up for relative change. And in fact, there's cause for cheering if that's the threshold. But in fact, for reading, threshold is this. This is all, oh no. It doesn't matter whether it goes up or not. Because there are many, many things that, where you have to get to the real version of the thing before you're doing it at all. In the 21st century, it doesn't ha help to read just a little bit. You have to be fluent at it. So this is a huge problem. And once you draw the threshold in there, immediately converts this thing that looked wonderful into a huge qualitative gap. And the gap is widening. And we have two concepts that are enemies of what we need to do, perfect and better. Right? So better is a way of getting fake success. We had improvement. You see it all the time. It's the ultimate quarterly report. We had improvements here. And perfect is tough 
to get in this world. So both of those are really bad. So what you want is what's actually needed. And the exquisite skill here, which I'm going to use these two geniuses, Thacker and Ingalls, to labor it. I'm going to call that the sweet spot. The way you make progress here is you pick the thing that is just over that threshold that is qualitatively better than all the rest of the crap you can do. You can spend billions churning around. And once you do that, you widen up. You give yourself a little blue plane to operate in. And for a while, everything you do in there is something that is actually going to be meaningful uh, and will not just bring lots of money. I mean, money you get automatically out of doing this stuff even reasonably well. But the best thing you get out of this stuff is a way of enabling people to think about the situation that they're in better and not be overwhelmed with it. 